Good day, everybody, and um, welcome to North's Ukraine webinar. I I'm Colin Gillespie, uh, head of the Loss Prevention Department at North, and I'll be moderator to today. Uh, the format's going to be uh, a panel discussion. I'll ask the panelists a few questions, and then at the end, we'll have a, a, an open Q&A session. So please remember to put any of your questions into the chat function and we'll try to deal with them within the webinar. Uh, if we don't get a chance to do that, we'll follow up in writing afterwards. Uh, we've also got a number of pre-submitted questions, so we'll try and deal with those also. Uh, today's panel consists of uh, North leading people uh, in with respect to Ukraine in each business area. So we've got Belinda Ward, who heads up on personal injury and illness issues, David Richards, who heads up wider PI issues, Sanchit, who will have a look at what's going on in the war risk market, uh, Mark Church, who is uh, our expert on sanctions, Mike Hope, who will be looking at FDD and contractual issues, and Mike Salthouse, who will talk about uh, IG outreach and the, the coordination of things that's going on at the international group. OK, so I think we'll start because it's first and foremost a, a humanitarian issue. Uh, we'll start with Belinda. Uh, Belinda, if I could just ask you a question. Um, apart from the practical shipping issues, the, the conflict has had a, a terrible impact on the Ukrainian people. Uh, and including Ukrainian seafarers who, uh, you know, are working on ships away from home. Can you tell me a bit about how the, the personal injury department at North has been dealing with those things? Morning, so Colin. I just resolved that, hopefully. Sorry. <laughs> Morning, Colin. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, well, I'll be honest, after all the additional claims handled by the personal injury team arising out of COVID involving uh, situations and queries we hadn't anticipated, we had expected something similar resulting from the conflict in Ukraine, um, especially as Ukrainians, they, they do make up one of the most common crew nationalities, you know, as indeed do Russians, um, and this is reflected on our own members' vessels. In reality, however, I must admit, from a claims perspective, it hasn't been as work intensive as probably anticipated. Um, in our experience, the two main recruitment centres for crew are in Mariupol and in Odessa, where North has a dedicated pre-employment medical programme, and which in that capacity I have you know, previously visited. The devastation in the former has been widely documented. And sadly, it seems the latter is now also coming under fire. Um, and, and this clearly has affected a large proportion of Ukrainian crew. Um, and although our members employing them will have a, a far better insight into the practical issues than I do, from a, a PI perspective, there are some you know, main themes. Um, so I'd say in, in the earlier days, weeks of the conflict, we did have a lot of crew wanting to leave the vessels before the completion of their contracts. Um, this included a few Ukrainian crew deserting their respective vessels and requesting refugee status, mostly in the States. But most commonly, it was from a natural desire to get back home to be with their family and, and perhaps even sign up into the army. And yeah, that's not PMI as such, but we did try to assist members by highlighting the, the legal considerations and uh, you know, discussing how best to manage the practical problem of not being able to arrange transportation you know, all the way, literally back to their, their front door. Um, more obviously, crew continue to be injured or to be taken ill whilst on board, including Ukrainians, and at some point they'll be ready for repatriation home. Um, Often at home, they will require ongoing treatment. So how, and, and most importantly, where do we manage this treatment? It, it's sometimes a major issue to resolve, especially when we can't always contact their next of kin at the moment, which is another worry for the crew. Um, and then there are those crew who are injured, you know, taken ill prior to the conflict and are now already undergoing long-term care back home 
for sometimes very serious conditions in the Ukraine. Um, and we now find ourselves often unable to follow up and have no idea how they're faring, which is, is a big worry. The other main inquiries we've received are around Ukrainian crew being on board when the vessel calls at Russian ports. We are aware of several instances of such crew being questioned, having their personal devices removed and having even been taken ashore for questioning, including, it seems, some not returned back on board, although that latter hasn't been an issue for any of uh, our vessels yet, as yet. Um, and then payment of settlements, monies and wages, some crew requesting delays in payments whilst they set up alternative accounts outside of the Ukraine as they're concerned about accessing money later on. And we've also been trying to assess generally with crew related queries as much as we're able. I mean, obviously, Colin, the work your guys do in, in loss prevention, in collating and circulating all coming invoices and information from third parties with whom we work has been enormously helpful in, in that respect. And, and, and for that, you know, my team, thank you. Thanks, B. B, uh, could you also say something about what North's doing on the sort of more um, charitable side of things and how we're trying to, to help the humanitarian situation in Ukraine? Um, yeah, sure. Um, we have an ongoing and long term person injury initiative, Mind Matters, which is designed to support all crew on our members' vessels with mental welfare. This includes Mind Call, um, which is a uh, confidential 24 7 helpline in many different languages. Um, but specifically in relation to the Ukrainian crisis, North, through our corporate social responsibility program, has uh, we were donated to the Seafarers International Relief Fund, which is a, a central charitable fund to respond to emergencies affecting seafarers and their families, and is now supporting seafarers and their families impacted by the, uh, the crisis in Ukraine. And we've also donated to the British Red Cross to get critical care to the front line and the bordering countries. Um, my own personal injury team in, in contact with the uh, PEMI team in Odessa, has been putting together medical supplies to send over, which are now becoming harder to get locally. Um, and as you're aware, Colin, colleagues of ours have been volunteering um, at the Polish um, centre in Newcastle, sorting incoming supplies and, and, and so on to send those out to, to uh, families who are now um, you know, spread all over. So, yeah, there's a lot going on and, and we're trying to do our bit. Thanks, B. It, it, it's great to hear that we can help our members in some way, uh, you know, in, in the crisis and the difficulties they they will have with with their crew, who who uh, you know are, are in a very bad situation, really. So thank you very much, B. Uh, David, uh, can you say something about the wider PNI issues? And maybe touch on the interaction between um, PNI and and war risks, please. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, thank you, Colin. Um, so, in addition to the uh, crew and people issues, which uh, Blinda has spoken about, those working in the claims department handling PNI matters have largely been providing practical support to members who were either immediately impacted by the conflict in Ukraine, or where they are trading to Russian ports uh, and non-Russian ports on the Black Sea. Um, when it comes to that immediate and direct impact, uh, a number of vessels within our mutual membership found themselves trapped at ports in Ukraine, uh, and uh, that required evacuation of the crew on board. Uh, and for those ships, um, the, the whole uh, association uh, supported our members. Uh, those members were also liaising with flag and class uh, in relation to those partial evacuations. And in many cases, that involved uh, replacement crew uh, of Ukrainian nationals coming on board to ensure uh, a minimum level of safe manning. Uh, for those members who were planning calls at either Russian ports or non-Russian ports on the Black Sea, uh, the claims department uh, was like giving advice uh, on the practical impact of on claims handling arising from the crisis and uh, the increased sanctions risk. Um, the situation was, and, and, and it remains very dynamic. Uh, so we were having to keep uh, abreast of the uh, developments um, as they uh, came along. Uh, 
our advice was largely to the effect that there was no issue from a cover perspective with lawful and prudent trade to uh, those areas, but that the conflict and the increased sanctions risk could cause situations where there might be practical difficulties achieving the full benefits of cover, whether that would uh, involve provision of security, difficulties in handling and settling and paying claims, difficulties appointing surveyors, things like that. Uh, we've also briefed members individually and uh, with a public article about, uh, as you said in your question, the interaction between North's Class 1 PNI cover and PNI war risks cover. So, like all international group PNI clubs, uh, our rules contain a standard exclusion uh, for losses caused by war or hostile act by or against a belligerent power, things like that. It's a very wide exclusion, and in this crisis, it, its application is less about the nature of what's going on, more about assessing uh, whether the proximate cause of any loss arises from that conflict. But, but generally speaking, uh, we think that most of the additional PI risks flowing from this crisis are going to fall in the first instance uh, for a mutual owner entry member uh, to PI war rather than class one PI. And that primary cover for war PI risks may be with North or it may be with another underwriter. So at the start of this crisis, we found ourselves spending uh, time trying to remind members of the difference between class one PI and war PI. And of course, while, while we look to support our members by answering their inquiries and providing advice and practical guidance, we had to emphasize the need to speak to war risk underwriters uh, when uh, considering these sorts of trades. Uh, there is a second layer of class one PI war risks cover for mutual owner entry members, uh, which kicks in above a minimum of insured value. Uh, and the position for charter entries may be different because charters war PI uh, may be part of that class one entry from the ground up, depending on the exact terms. Um, a lot of the other practical questions we've seen uh, have largely concerned the liner trade, uh, particularly uh, from container operators who have had to deal with delays in handling time sensitive cargo bound for Russia uh, and uh, often helping with questions about the scope of the liberty clauses in their contracts and whether uh, that might allow them to avoid Russian ports, deviate and discharge the cargo elsewhere if that's what they prefer to do. Um, but as, as, as Belinda said in uh, in her section, that there haven't been yet a, a lot of claims flowing from this crisis, but a lot of inquiries. Thanks very much, David. And uh, the article that you and Sancho wrote uh, concerning you know the interaction between PNI cover and war risks was very informative. And uh, I'd just like to remind everybody uh, on the webinar that that's still available on our website. In the in the Ukraine uh, section, I think Sanchez that leads me on to uh, war risks quite nicely. Um, what's the situation with war risks cover for vessels calling it at ports in Russia and Ukraine at, at the minute, Sanchez? Uh, hi, hi, Colin. Thanks. Yeah, um, there's obviously you know for for obvious reasons there's been there have been a lot of developments in the war market. So much so that the, the activities in the Persian Gulf have taken a backseat after many, many years now. Um, war cover is still available in a, in a nutshell, but it's very, um, very limited. So unfortunately, it's not a yes or no answer in terms of whether cover, cover is available for calls to Ukraine or Russia. As far as Ukraine is concerned, most of the ports are actually closed. And uh, you know, to the best of our knowledge, there are only a few ports in the Danube River which are still open. So cover for calling at these ports is available, although the APs will very much reflect the risk involved. And the markets which are willing to offer such cover are also shrinking by the day. So the situation may be quite different if we were having this conversation a month down the line, say. Very few markets, if any at all, will actually take on any new business in relation to Ukraine or Russia calls. As far as uh, Russia is concerned, uh, again, cover is available. And uh, as with Ukraine, the capacity is is certainly decreasing day by day. 
many underwriters and reinsurers are pulling out completely from offering cover or, and others are offering only very limited cover. In fact, many treaty policies re, uh, renewing on the 1st of May actually excluded claims in relation to Ukraine and Russia. And uh, the expectation uh, as at current appetite levels is that the same will happen on around the 1st of January when another big tranche of treaty policies uh, renew in the London market. Uh, of course, these things, this might change if the conflict ends before the end of the year, but I, I should add that currently that is not the expectation. And uh, again, we, you know, it's not, we, we refer to the war market, uh, owner's war market, um, but as David uh, alluded to there, you know, there's also the charter's war market. And as, as we understand it, there are at least three PNI clubs that have issued notices of cancellation under their charters war policies. And although cover is reinstated immediately upon the expiry of those notices, it excludes risks such as seizure and detention. And I would think many other charters war providers will have their policies under constant review as we speak. Okay, thanks, Sanjit. Um, in terms of actual paid losses, what's the situation in the war market? Have there been any yet? And uh, what what are what is the market predicting the losses might be? Yeah, so uh, actually, it's a good question. Um, it's it's probably true to say that there haven't been many losses paid out at this time. Um, and, and I understand there have only been a few instances of actual physical damage in the last one month or two. So the majority of losses paid out so far have been in relation to getting crew members out of Ukraine, as B was talking about earlier. Um, but this is all along expected lines because the first tranche of uh, losses in relation to blocking and trapping are expected in August and then another big tranche in March next year. And this is all in uh, in line as to you know when losses are crystallized under those policies, whether blocking and trapping has a six month period or a 12 month period. It's also probably worth bearing in mind that the market is not reacting to war losses alone. As you know, many reinsurers have multiple lines of business and we've seen very significant losses in the aviation and political violence uh, markets. And uh, as, so as such, you know, many reinsurers simply don't have the capacity for further losses in relation to this particular conflict and therefore the reduction, commensurate reduction in capacity. Going forward, um, you know, much depends on how the war develops, but as a matter of good housekeeping, ship owners should keep their vessel values up to date uh, for their H&M and war policies. David spoke about uh, in proper insured values, and it's important that that is uh, a, a, a keen eye is kept on that. And finally, I'd also say that uh, again, depending on how the war develops, you know, owners thinking of entering long-term contracts should be mindful that availability of war cover in relation to Ukraine and Russia calls could be severely limited as we head into next year. Things are changing, uh, you know, quite quickly in the war market. The listed areas themselves have changed at least twice since the beginning of the conflict, which is, uh, you know, which is a very short time frame in the war market. So uh, we we'll, we'll just have to keep an eye on how the conflict develops. Okay. Thanks very much, Sans. I think that uh, that leads me into probably the FD&D side of things quite well, and Mike Hope. Mike, um, obviously, where the the war risk area has expanded, and it includes all of Russia now. How has that uh, driven work and inquiries in, in FD&D on the contractual side of things? Yes. Uh, uh, thanks, Colin. Uh, good morning to to everyone. Yeah, it, uh, that question uh, kind of highlights the overarching uh, sort of queries that we have received since this all started, and that is highlighting the tension between those parties who really do not, who want to avoid all risk versus those who do see an opportunity to uh, be made by trading still to, to Russia. So the when the JWC uh, announced the whole of Russia as a, an AP area, we did receive a lot of inquiries from members in, who are, are trying to avoid the risk by saying, well, can we now rely upon this as a war risk under our war risk clause, such as the calm wartime or the void war uh, clauses, for example. 
uh, the, unfortunately, the uh, the fact that additional premium is now being sorry, the area is now being uh, designated uh, a war risk for additional premium is not going to be sufficient alone to to avoid those risks. Uh, but we've, uh, you know, just following on from that, that's obviously been, as I said, the the main focus of a lot of the questions is is this tension uh, between uh, those avoiding uh, risk and those seeing the opportunities. So uh, we, we did have a lot of inquiries along these lines at the very beginning, uh, though uh, somewhat maybe surprisingly, it, these have uh, trailed off to a large extent as uh, as uh, things have become a bit more, uh, relatively speaking, settled, which is not maybe the best word to use under the situation. OK, thank you, Mike. No I think I'll move on to, to Mark Church now uh, and, uh, you know, a, a question on sanctions. The, the sanctions picture with respect to the, 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 the war is uh, further reaching and has a bigger economic impact than, than anything we've seen before due to the size of the Russian economy and the trading links it's got all around the world. So the, the, the sanctions are, are far reaching, Mark. It, it's a fast moving situation. How do how do we and how do members keep on top of the situation? Yeah, thanks, Colin. Hi, everybody. Obviously, a huge, huge topic and one of significant complexity. I think the first thing to say is that significant sanctions have been imposed, as I'm sure most of you will be aware, by the US, by the EU, by the UK, and indeed by other countries. And whilst the overall aims of the sanctions are largely the same. There are material differences between the sanctions that have been imposed by UK, EU and US. And so the first question that you need to consider is, well, what sanctions apply to me and to my company? But the analysis that you need to do is actually wider than that. So it can be tempting to say, OK, well, I'm a ship owner in the Middle East, therefore I look at it and think, well, EU sanctions mm, don't apply to me. UK maybe don't apply. US, well, I know there's some extraterritorial effect of those sanctions, so I need to worry about them. But you also need to consider that there will be other um, banks, insurers, other parties in the charter party chain that maybe are in the EU or are in the UK. So you need to do a broad analysis and consider not only the impact on you, but also consider the impact on your contractual partners and your insurers and banks. I'll give you an example. The key EU regulation uh, 833 of 2014 states that it's prohibited to transport iron and steel products as listed if they originate in Russia or are being exported from Russia to any other country. Now, if you're a non-EU ship owner, that prohibition will not directly bite on you. So it may be lawful for you as a non-EU ship owner to carry iron from Russia to another country. But very importantly, the regulation goes on to say that it will be prohibited to provide insurance in relation to that prohibition. So if you are an EU insurer, then you cannot insure that, that carriage of iron, even if the underlying transport is perfectly lawful. So the point I'm trying to get across is that it's a really broad analysis. You need to consider not only what is the impact on you, but what's the impact on your contractual partners, insurers and banks. Uh, it's a problem that we all try and uh, that we all struggle with to a greater or lesser extent is how do we just keep on top of what's going on in the sanctions world where you have these different bodies and different countries. It seems like introducing new sanctions almost on a daily basis. I think it's helpful to split the analysis into two parts, looking at the party related sanctions and the activity related sanctions. Put even more simply, you need to consider who's involved and what's involved. Now, the who's involved is superficially at least fairly straightforward because the EU, UK and US all, all have lists of sanctions targets. All of those lists are available 
online, publicly, freely available. And I know the authorities uh, take a dim view to anybody that doesn't take the simple step of checking those online lists. See if the Russian company that you are dealing with is expressly sanctioned. That is very easy uh, to do. If you go to our website, we've got a guide to sanctions on there, which has got the, the hyperlinks to the UK and EU US uh, websites for searching. A lot of our members have now also considered purchasing screening software, which will do all the checking for you. So you put the name in the of the company or the individual into that software and it will screen not only UK, US, EU lists, but also Canadian sanctions, Singaporean sanctions, uh, all the different sanctions lists around the, the around the world. Now, the advantage, one of the key advantages, I think, of using screening software is that many of the products now will also highlight links to designated individuals or uh, or companies because one of the real challenges that we're finding at the minute on the russian side is that the eu and uk in particular have sanctioned specific oligarchs but haven't expressly sanctioned the companies which they control which means that you can there can be a real uh, it can be a real gray area and it can be very, very difficult to work out. Well, I can see that the uh, who I think is the owner of this company is sanctioned, but I'm not sure what his, interest, his current interest in that company is. And I'm not sure whether the company that I'm actually dealing with is deemed sanctioned or not, because if you are, if the company is owned or controlled by an individual who is listed, then the starting point is that they are deemed sanctioned, whether expressly listed or not. So that ownership and control analysis is really, really tricky. And that's where I think the, the real key benefit of screening software uh, comes in to help with that analysis. So uh, Thomson's uh, Reuters World Check is one of these, one of the products. There are there are uh, others out there. You'd be unsurprised to hear it's a bit of a, a growth industry and um, people providing the software where you where you where you can uh, do your checks. So that's the first element is who's involved. Uh, the second element, what are you carrying? Uh, unfortunately, if anything, this is even trickier because it really relies on going into the underlying legislation and reading the um, reading the legislation and trying to work out which cargoes are uh, uh, impacted. Now, the good news is on the EU side, every time there is a change to the Russian sanctions, that change is reflected in the EU regulation 833-2014. So if you if you Google um, EU reg 833-2014, uh, you'll come up with the European Union website and you can click on the consolidated version, which is the latest version as of 13th of April 2022. So every time there's a change, that change finds itself in to the underlying regulation. So that's the one regulation which is really, really important uh, to have a look at and see, OK, I'm looking at a cargo of iron, fertiliser, steel, oil, whatever it may be, and I want to see whether the sanctions impact on that voyage. You need to be reading the EU uh, EU regulation 833 uh, 2014. Uh, if you uh, if you do have a look at it and you open it, you will find that unfortunately it is now 175 pages long. Um, so the danger is by the time that you get to uh, read the whole regulation, then you will be, um, then the opportunity, the business opportunity may have been uh, lost because it will take you a while to wade through the whole thing. So there are summaries of the sanctions available, uh, not least again on our website, we produced a summary on the 13th of April of the uh, sanctions as they were. Then obviously we are anticipating another round of EU sanctions coming very, very shortly um, with a focus on oil. Uh, the EU also have um, another really useful resource is the EU sanctions map. Again, if you stick that into Google, you'll, it, it will pop up. This is something that the EU developed just to give a summary, not only of the sanctions against Russia, but also against sanctions uh, against sanctions imposed in the other countries which are targeted by the EU. And that's a really user friendly, easy resource, quick summary of the sanctions. And obviously the EU do keep that up to date. So I would really um, I, I would really encourage people to have a have a look at that. I think the it, 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 the other thing just to be aware of is you can do the analysis. You can say, OK, UK, I'm happy. EU, I'm happy. US, I'm fairly happy. 
and we're discharging in a, a country which is outside of all of those areas. You want to check, obviously, one of the things that we're seeing are port bans, uh, bans against Russian uh, flagged and Russian owned shipped, uh, own, own ships going into particular ports, but also the carriage of particular Russian cargoes being banned from different ports. So you want to also obviously check at the load and discharge port the impact on on the ability to um, uh, on the ability to do your your voyage final point on keeping up to date the worst thing to do or not the worst thing but one thing that you have to be cautious of is not relying on promises or statements from other parties while well, i've done my checks um so you can be happy that everything is lawful however um, you know, wh whoever is telling you that, telling you that, however big and important that company is, because you can't be sure that that company has to comply with the same sanctions that you do. Um, they may, they will be doing a different analysis, looking at whether EU, UK, US applies. And so we really encourage people to do their own, do their own checks. Thanks, Mark. Uh, we're getting quite a lot of questions in, which we'll, we'll deal with. Uh deal with at the end and also we'll, we'll provide links to the, the various things we've talked about. Mark, I, I've got one other question, you know, trading to Russia seems to be legal in, in lots of circumstances, but the sanctions around it are creating a lot of problems. So it, it's becoming less and less practicable, let, let's say, to, to actually trade there with insurance cover. Could you tell me something about that? Yeah, I mean, in brief, you're completely correct, Colin. Obviously, there is no complete trade ban uh, with uh, in, with Russia, but there are a few practical considerations to take into account, even where you've done the sanctions analysis and you're satisfied that the cargo and the parties do not prevent risks which you're not prepared to take. Uh, four very, very quick uh, practical considerations to take into account. Firstly, and perhaps most importantly, uh, many Western banks now are very reluctant to uh, to process Russian related payments. So it's all very well doing the legal analysis, but if you find out you can't get higher or freight paid, then query whether you'd want to be doing that voyage in any event. Uh, secondly, there are inherent risks with any Russian related voyage. And I think this probably goes most pertinently to the fact that how much of any Russian company, if you haven't really digged down into the ownership uh, analysis. There's always a slight risk that actually you find out the CEO or um, or owner of that company is actually listed. So there is an inherent risk with any Russian business. And thirdly, things change. As I say, we're expecting more EU sanctions. Uh, we have seen you know, wind down periods be removed uh, previously. And as you said, Colin, it's a very fast moving picture. So just because something looks OK today, uh, tomorrow, when your vessel is full of a particular cargo, the position may change to your uh, to your detriment, and then finally, and this is a point which uh, which Mike Salthouse will I think pick up on um, in a little moment. Uh, at the moment, we are only able to insure vessels calling Russia by virtue of a specific uh, general license which has been issued by the UK to allow insurers to provide cover. And our understanding is that in order to take advantage of that license we need to be able to keep a record of north ships calling russia and there's been discussions ongoing which mike's been uh, leading to try and understand what that actually means in practice but that's another uh, another thing to just be uh, conscious of thanks mark that, that, that's really good uh, summary i think of a, a very complex and uh, quickly changing sanctions picture. Mike, uh, what Mark said led very neatly in, in, into your bit and what outreach is happening via the international group, uh, how you're engaging with the, with the different authorities to try and get some clarity on the, on the fast changing picture. Yeah, thank, well, thank, thanks everybody. Uh, good morning, everyone. For, uh, very nice to see you. Um, yes, I mean, 24th of February, Russia invades Ukraine. This isn't just um, an industry event, uh, a shipping event, it's a world event. Um, and global trade has been severely impacted uh, be because of the size of the Russian economy. It's a G20 economy. Um, the future 
looks very different. Um, and I don't actually think we're ever really going to go back to the position that we were in immediately before. And that, that's very relevant to all of us because we're all involved in uh, a globalised trading world. That's the world that I've grown up in in terms of shipping uh, and probably most of you. Um, I don't think we're going to go back to the world. Uh, and I don't want to overstate things, but I think that that is the reality and we need to get used to this new new reality. So the role of the IG in all of this, well, you, you keep seeing us being referred to in the press occasionally by governments concerning uh, what we do in terms of supporting lawful trade uh, to and from Russia. It's important to remember that the group is only one part of the suite of financial services that tend to be subjected to sanctions which target maritime trade. Um, what we have done over the last few years, um, and, I'm, and I'm proud of our, our role in this, is, has been to develop a mature and trusted relationship with the sanctioning authorities in, our, in the, the most relevant jurisdictions to, um, uh, to us, which is the US, the UK and the European Union. And this, um, particularly when we get um, a lot of sanctions coming in very quickly, allows us to engage with legislators. We can guide them as experts um, um, on the likely impact of the measures that they're considering. Uh, before they come into uh, into into play, uh, we can get clarification reasonably quickly uh, on the scope of legislation where it's not clear. And also, when when they get it wrong, as they do, um, we can lobby for amendments um, to you know to, to correct the unintended consequences. And then, of course, we have to communicate that to you, the uh, the wider membership. So, uh, in that regard, you know, we've we've obviously been very active. The, the subcommittees met three times uh, since the crisis has started. There's been lots of informal meetings uh, going on as well. What we also did fairly early on was to establish an expedited system of legislative updates, so that whichever club you're a member of, you should be getting the same information drafted by the same people more quickly than you might normally have done uh, in in previous crises. And Mark's heavily involved with that. So um, if you look at the industry news section of our website um, and keep, keep up to date with that, uh, what we are saying about new legislation should be pretty, well, it should be identical to what the West is saying or what the UK clubs are saying and so on. We haven't had any circulars out yet. Um, circulars obviously we reserve for uh, things that really affect the, the insurance relationship between member uh, and club. Um, there is one though, as Mark alluded to, coming out probably next week. Uh, and that concerns the UK government general trade license of 17th of March, which was had to be published um, following some engagement uh, from us and industry to clarify earlier amendments that have been made to the UK Russian sanctions regulations. And as Mark said uh, very clearly, what, what that does is it cleared up the confusion as to whether or not it was lawful for us to ensure any vessel calling to Russia or transiting Russian waters. Um, but um, bid pro quo is that we're going to have to maintain a register of vessels that are going in there. So if you're trading to Russia, uh, you'll have to tell us um, and we'll have to keep a record. And the requirements um, of that record keeping are quite onerous. There's quite a lot of detail um, that you're going to have to provide um, to us to continue. We haven't talked much about reinsurance. Obviously, that's the reason why the international group exists. Um, the, the group um, is a very cost effective way of purchasing very high levels of reinsurance for uh, the world's ship owning fleets. Um, I think the point with this is just just remember this is the biggest sanctions program we've ever seen. Um, all IG club rules will exclude any part of a claim that cannot be recovered from reinsurers by reason of sanctions. Shortfalls, therefore, borne by you, uh, the members. Um, and the, the risk um, of a reinsurer or bank failure to transact a reinsurer's contribution um, is, is something that you um, will will pick up. Because the Russian sanctions are so focused on banks, uh, this there is a much greater risk of reinsurer bank default involved in a Russian trade than we've ever really seen before. And this goes back to Mark's point, even though the trade is lawful for you as a ship owner to perform, um, claims that, um, and it may be lawful for us to insure, um, you know, we, can't, we, we don't know what the position might be for some people on our reinsurance programme. We don't necessarily know what the position is for all, all the individual clubs domiciled in the various jurisdictions that they're actually uh, based in. Uh, and that is a risk, unfortunately, that, that is, is associated now with, with Russian sh shipping, uh, very Russian trade um, and, and port calls. Um, engagement with governments very, very quickly. Obviously, you commission met them a number of times. UK government has been a lot of engagement with them, particularly in relation to the 17th of March license. Um, US State Department, um, to our great relief, have been a lot um, quieter this time around. They've very much, they've been very happy to let the Europeans and the British 
uh, pr principally the Europeans actually take the, the lead in terms of the sanctions measures that are coming out because they're all trying to act in concert. Uh, so there's a lot of talk about an EU oil ban at the moment. Um, and what, what seems to be fairly clear is that once the European Union, which is the most reliant of those three sanctioning authorities, has decided on the scope um, of this ban, then you'll probably see supporting consistent measures from the UK, US, and indeed, and again, this is a point that Mark made, lots of other sanctioning authorities as well. So the major trading nations such as Japan, Canada, Australia, and quite a few more as well. Uh, but it will be the Europeans who will um, set the bar and then everybody will sort of coalesce around that with supporting legislation. Um, Michael, on that point, on yep. that point um, there's been a lot in the press this week about the oil ban, which doesn't seem to be going ahead for now, and some suggestion that the, the, the EU might use or might stop insurers from insuring vessels carrying oil, but not actually stop those vessels carrying oil. How do you see that playing out? Um, well, first of all, I think uh, that the European Union made the mistake of saying we're going to have an oil ban um, and, and put that into the public domain without really securing the agreement of the 27 nations um, that comprise the EU. So you'll, you've probably seen it's been playing out in the press as to what that oil ban will actually look like. Um, you know, the, the, the suggestion is there was also going to be a blanket ban on EU vessels and EU insurers um, carrying oil out with the EU, so from Russia to, to China or Russia to, to, to India. Um, that may have been uh, watered down. It, it, it may not. Um, I would point out that if it's to be effective um, in, in terms of its political objective, which is to stop money going into Russia, uh, then it is going to, at some level, have to attach to trades that are outside Europe as, uh, Europe as well. The simple answer is we, we, we don't really know what that's going to look like um, because of the um, the difficulty that Europe has in terms of finding an alternative supply. Uh, but as the war goes on, everybody's attitude is hardening. And therefore, I think um, we, we, you know, if you're a, if you're a Greek tanker operator or, a, you know, an Indian uh, tanker operator looking at doing those trades, um, there is a, there is an inc a high risk and an increasing risk uh, that you will not be able to do so, either because you yourselves are prevented from uh, direct EU legislation, or um, because um, the the insurance market simply won't be able to to provide cover for that, and you'd have to find alternative uh, uh, alternative covers really outside uh, Western Western finance, and, and that, that that the sort of levels of cover that you want in in, in anchor trades is will pro probably be quite quite challenging. Thanks, Mike. It's a very complex and fast moving situation, and you know. The, the work you're doing to try and get some clarity and get the point of the insurers across is, 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 is great stuff. It's very important uh, that, that that happens. I think we've reached the, uh, the Q&A uh, session. We've got some questions in. I think the first one's a very practical question. Um, the you know, cover if it's non-sanctioned cargo, non-sanctioned entities is available. Uh, is it correct? But what are the sort of practical difficulties around that uh, provision of security uh, and those sort of things? I think perhaps, David, that might be for you to comment on. Sure. Y yes, I, I think that, that comes back to what I said when I was speaking earlier that you know, for, for lawful and, and, and prudent trade, uh, cover is there. Um, for the risks which are caused by the crisis that is going to primarily go to war risk p and i instead of your standard class one p and i um I, I think the question suggests that you know if, if it's if it's a pollution incident therefore it's not caused by uh the the conflict but that that's not necessarily the case you would have to look in every specific uh situation to assess well what really caused this uh, and um you know, it, it, not simply the last in time. So, you know, you, you're, you're trapped at a Ukrainian port and then something happens to your ship and that results in pollution. Therefore, the pollution is separate from the trapping. It may be that the only reason that uh, whatever gave rise to the damage that caused the pollution, that may have only happened because of the conflict and therefore it falls within the exclusion and is transferred over to war P&I. Uh, but you'd have to look at each particular situation to assess where 
the cover lay. And of course, the, the other thing to bear in mind is that for something like pollution, war should be an exception to liability in the first place. So in most cases, there shouldn't be a liability falling to P&I because war is an exclusion under most international conventions, uh, which P&I cover responds to. OK, thanks, David. Uh, the, the next question is around screening software, and I see that Amanda Hastings has given a few examples. Uh, I think and Mark gave one in the in in the talk. So there's a few examples there, and we'll 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 follow up with that also. Uh, another question: Can it be considered lawful to load coal, for instance, from Russia to discharge outside of the UK? Uh, but you know, what additional contracts should be checked? Is there anything else that can be done other than what? Mark, you, you've said. I think that's probably for you, Mark. Yeah, I mean, just on on coal. So the uh, the EU regulation that I, I mentioned provides is prohibited to purchase, import, or transfer directly or indirectly coal into the European Union if it originates in Russia or or is exported from Russia. So there's a there's a you know there was there's a ban on the transport into the uh, into the EU. Uh, it's not it, at the moment. I don't believe it goes as far as to say that you can that if you're discharging out of the EU, that would be necessarily an unlawful voyage. But there's a number of factors to consider, not least okay, who are the who are the shippers and all the party related sanctions. But the, the cargo is going to be discharged somewhere and there may be sanctions that apply in that particular uh, in that particular port which would impact on the legality of the voyage and then we have all the practical considerations around insurance banking um, and the, the, the fact that the sanctions may change going going forward and uh, so i think on all of these it's kind of it's it's difficult to give a very simple straight answer really you need to look at exactly what the cargo is exactly who the parties are um, which sanctions apply to them and then do an analysis and record that that analysis has been has been done. And cross your fingers and hope that that's enough if the authorities don't like it. <laughs> uh, OK, a very practical question next from from Neil Paddy. Uh, if a vessel in a Ukrainian port gets attacked, is there a mechanism for the injured crew members to get treatment? Uh, B, uh, have you heard anything around that, either from our experience or international group experience? Um, only uh, small bits here and there, Colin. And unfortunately, there's no easy answer because it's going to very much depend on the scale of the attack, the port where it happens and the day on which it occurs. Um, you know, what is available in each part of the country varies enormously. And also who is in control of that area? Is it under Ukrainian control? Is it under Russian control? Um, Generally, a serious attack in any time will be immediately attended to by the civil authorities rather than be arranged you know, privately you know, by the club or the members. Um, and then we would follow up on that. The same would have to apply here, but we don't know how effective that would be, um, what is available you know, in each port at any given time. So we will be reliant upon the local authorities in conjunction with um, what is coming out from the vessel to tell us what the situation is locally. We will then talk to our correspondents to see if there's anything else we could do. But it, as I say, it's going to very much depend on the scale of the, the incident, where it is, who's in control of the port and how safe it is at that time. I think that probably follows for the second part of the question as well, that wouldn't it be that if there was an oil spill, and there's probably more for David, but we really are um, dependent on the local authorities, who's in control and how they want to react to it, uh, because th there's just no way you're going to get the normal response into anywhere whilst it's being shelled or, or, or is under under some sort of uh, heavy fighting. So, you know, it, it's just a, that, that, that sort of st stuff is, you know, to be decided if it happens, we'll, we'll respond 
No, sorry, yeah, just to say, Colin, we can never expect our correspondents or the you know, third parties we deal with and who do an amazing work all year, all year round and are still doing that in Ukraine to actually put themselves into um, physical danger. Um, so there's only so much that we can ask of them in those incidents. Yeah. Yeah. OK, I hope that answers your question, Neil. Uh, uh, a question here around the, the JWC bullet and that expands the, the, the war risk area to the, the entire Russian uh, and Black Sea coast. Basically, why? what is the reason for that? Why is the whole of Russia included, Sachit? Yeah, um, it's a it's a uh, it's a question that's you know uh, vexed a few quite a few people. So the, the J JWC, just to you know, I guess everybody is aware that JWC retains independent uh, security advisors who provide objective input into JWC, and they also get intelligence input from the governments, you know, to make their decisions. And the listed areas are basically areas of perceived enhanced risk, and then thereafter the rating uh, is is a matter for individual underwriters and their um, uh, risk appetites. The, at the time that the JWC 030 was uh, was uh, issued, the listed areas, the amendment was issued. That it was it followed um, the Russian state confiscating a large number of aircraft, so the aviation market suffered heavy losses. And there has been uh, solid intelligence input that uh, uh, of the risk of confiscation of ships by the Russian state in the future. And that is one of the main reasons why the Baltic and the Pacific coasts of Russia was also uh, added as a listed area. But of course, you know the the difference in the AP. So I think in in uh, you know if, say for example, if somebody was to call Novorossiysk, you'd still have APs between one and three percent, um, whereas the other parts of Russia, the Baltic and Pacific coasts, are 0.2 percent. So the the difference, the lower APs also reflect um, the the lesser risk as compared to the Black Sea area. Okay, thanks, Sanchez. I think that's quite clear. Uh, question for for Mike Hope here. Uh, just to clear up something you said, Mike. Uh, unfortunately, the fact that an area is designated as an AP area is not going to be sufficient alone to avoid the CP stroke not call into the ports. Is that the case? Right. Okay. Um, yeah. What I was saying, and obviously this always depends upon the actual terms of the of the charter party, uh, as every lawyer will tell you. Uh, but what I was referring to was if you're relying solely on your standard war risk clauses, such as the BIMCO Con War Time or the BIMCO uh, Voy War, which has a definition of uh, of war risks, which uh, obviously includes uh, an element of actual danger to to the vessel crew and cargo. Uh, so that just the fact that the JWC has designated an area as an additional premium for the war risk insurance is not sufficient, uh, generally speaking, alone to uh, to to allow you to rely upon either one of those war risk type clauses. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's that was. Uh, I hope that clarifies what I was trying to say. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Quite a technical question for 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 Mark here. Uh, uh, companies listed in Annex 19 of the EU regulation are not contained in the consolidated EU sanctions list. Does this mean that these companies are not sanctioned, Mark? Yeah, it's a technical question, but actually quite a, quite an important one because uh, traditionally what's happened is that you have the the lists that you can search that we talked about where you do the screening and um, you can see whether a party is sanctioned or not. Now, those lists contain all the companies and individuals who are subject to, uh, basically subject to asset freezes. So almost anything, you, you can do almost nothing with those companies. But there are other companies which you can do some transactions, but not others. And they form part of the annex to the EU regulation, which I mentioned earlier, which is now 175 pages uh, long, 833 of 20, 2014. So the difference is if you're on the consolidated uh, EU sanctions list, then you're basically subject to an asset freeze. But there are other companies who are impacted by sanctions who are listed in the annex to the EU regulation 
uh, or one of the annexes to the EU regulation. The reason that they're in there is because it's not as straightforward for those companies as saying you can do nothing. Uh, there are perhaps wind down periods or particular transactions you can conduct with those companies. Uh, but you obviously need to therefore look at both. You need to do your screening against the consolidated lids, but also go back to the EU regulation and check the annexes because there are companies listed there as well as cargoes and, um, and activities. Uh, very clear. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. That answers our question nicely. Uh, question here from Mike Salthouse. Uh, Will the clubs issue guidance as to the information required from members in order for the clubs to provide P&I cover for vessels calling at Russian ports to comply with the conditions of the UK general licence? Yeah, I, I dropped a note in the chat box. Actually, we're we're working on the circular. It should be published next week. There's a there's a schedule that will be attached to that circular, which uh, sets out all the port uh, and partner information that you're going to have to have to provide. Um, I think it's it's probably a question of do your best, but the, the risk in not providing it clearly is that cover is going to be prejudiced and it, and it probably just goes to highlight um, really just how difficult it's becoming to do lawful trade to Russia um, going, uh, now and, and in going, going forward. So it's not going to become any easier. Thanks, Mike. It's quite clear. Uh, next question. Under Charter's p &I cover, are members required to declare and obtain clearance from the club before doing Russian business? Sanchez, that's an underwriting question. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Colin. Yeah, as it, as it stands, we don't we don't authorize um, uh, specific watches. We do, you know, help or guide members in their own due diligence. But it's important that members conduct their own due diligence before calling. I mean, as as everybody's highlighted, you know, there are either problems in relation to sanctions. There is lawful trade ongoing, um, especially in tribal commodities with Russia. But even even for those, there are severe practical difficulties in the clubs being able to assist. Um, and uh, depending on how the legislation evolves, uh, an obligation to to declare these the such calls to the clubs might very well be in the offing. So, uh, I mean, to to summarize, it's important. We, we don't you know give clearance as such. But we should be aware, and uh, I, I would expect that we are aware of members generally who are trading to Russia, and we expect that members conduct thoroughly their own due diligence in relation to sanctions and other matters that have been highlighted uh, here today. But this is a evolving situation, and an obligation to declare might well be coming down the line, as Mike said earlier. I don't know if Mike wants to add something to to that. Yeah, th thanks, Sachin. It's, it's a very good point. I mean, currently we're taking the view that charters aren't going to have to declare um, when they're going in. It's, it's actually much more difficult for us to track track charters that are calling um, to to Russia. But um, you know, it, it's one of the areas where we do engage with government to seek clarification. Um, the initial uh, conversations that we had with them were, was somewhat vague, and we've taken the view that at the moment we're just looking at vessels calling in Russia. Um, but that may change at some point in the future. And again, I, I, I can't emphasize this enough. It really just emphasizes the uh, difficulties and risks that people run uh, engaging in, in any Russian nexus trade at the present time. Even if we can insure it, there's no guarantee that our um, who partners or, or the insurance program will be able to follow us in the event of a claim. Thanks, Mike. Uh, question for Mark here, I think, Mark. When sanctions come in from the various authorities, uh, you know what time frames are, do you typically see the, the sanctions giving people to uh, maybe withdraw? Uh, and also, do you see individual companies being given any special dispensations? Yeah, I'd say thanks, Colin. Another good question. I mean, I think um, I'll talk about the EU sanctions because just picking up something that, that Mike Salthouse mentioned earlier, it's actually the EU which is, is which has been probably most active and have now got the most stringent sanctions in place against Russia. Now, there's there's a couple of things that can happen. One is that there may be specific uh, restrictions against a particular company which are introduced. So the Annex X1X companies that somebody mentioned earlier, uh, the people like Stofconflot on that on that list, 
often there will be wind down periods uh, allowing parties to to complete transactions or there'll be a cut off cut off date um, at which point the restrictions come into force if however it's simply a case of adding a company to the asset freeze list then often that will just be immediate so one of the big issues that we've been uh, that we've been dealing with in recent months is where all of a sudden overnight without any warning a company is added either to the eu designated parties list or to the uh, the us uh, equivalent list because then uh, immediately then you've got a problem um, in dealing with that company so it's probably risky to anticipate that there would necessarily be wind down periods because often it's just simply a case a, a company is is added to the list and that's and that's it now what we have found uh, on the eu side each eu member state has a competent authority uh, who is there to enforce and implement the sanctions and i'm sure it varies from country to country but actually what we have found is where members have have overnight gone through, gone through a position thinking, OK, we're carrying a cargo for a receiver who isn't sanctioned. And then they've got a question uh, as to whether that company all of a sudden has become sanctioned. And they're thinking, OK, what do we do with this cargo? What we have actually found is that a lot of the national uh, regulators in the various member states have been quite good in providing non-binding um, guidance. And so there is, you know, there is a there is a line of potential communication open to companies who find themselves overnight impacted by new uh, by new sanctions. The 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 uh, giving special exemption on a company by company basis, I think there's kind of there's a general reluctance. It's not something that um, in the US there's more of a tradition of giving uh, licenses. There's not really the same tradition in the EU or the or the UK, uh, but you might get some non binding caveated uh, guidance from either the UK or the individual member states. Uh, depending on the circumstances, you may get the answer. Well, it's up to you to do your due diligence and and that's it. But there is, an, there is a line of communication open to people who want to use it. OK, thanks very much, Mark. Uh, I think probably the next question, the next two questions are around depth of um, depth of due diligence and how how far down should owners go? I think probably that's around reasonableness of, 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 of their investiga investigations. Uh, one's just in general and the other one's specifically relating to STS. What, what's, what's your view on that, Mark? Yeah, I mean, this is this is one of the um, this is one of the, the questions that often we get asked. And unfortunately, it's one of the questions that we that we struggle to give a clear answer on. Uh, not least because I guess you have to look at it from the perspective of the individual regulator who's looking at the conduct. So the standards of due diligence required will be subtly different uh, in the US, EU, UK. You have to look at the legislation and whether it's a strict burden of proof or whether there's a reasonableness element in there, and that may differ depending on what the uh, what the sanctions are. And the other thing that we haven't really mentioned, of course, sanctions is hugely hugely political and the enforcement of sanctions is obviously also hugely political uh, so it's you're never quite sure uh, whether uh, and, and to what extent doing your due diligence is is obviously very very important uh, but there is a legal framework and a political background the political backdrop that you have to take into into consideration and the, the short answer is do as much as you can i know that's not very helpful it's a bit of a it's a bit of a cop out but it's but it's but it's true uh, it is an ownership and control analysis so if you if there is a a party that has um, as a 5% russian ownership in a company then that's that's not going to trigger it's very very unlikely to trigger any ownership or control analysis from the us or the uh, or the EU. It might, it, if, if that's public knowledge, perhaps the bank might ask more questions, um, but I would say it's probably unlikely to have a significant a significant impact. Obviously, that's different if you see the ultimate benefit, beneficial owner is a Russian oligarch who has been uh, who has been sanctioned, then that is problematic. And one of the real challenges that we've seen in recent months is where the oligarch has been sanctioned 
uh, you do you uh, you do your beneficial ownership analysis and you think okay i've got a problem here and then you're told by that company well actually that oligarch has now divested his interest perhaps his shares have gone to his wife or another family member and then you're into really difficult questions as whether as to whether you can carry on dealing with that business uh, business or not uh, but that's a long-winded way of saying it's really really difficult and do as much as you can thanks mark uh let me just move him down the question list This is probably one for Sanjit. It's a it's a bit of crystal ball gazing, I think, Sanjit. But can you see a new market arising in, in insurance to cover calls to Russia on a voyage basis if if the uh, if the sanctions regime does turn out not to not to allow insurance to cover voyages uh, uh, under a general license? Um, if you know, bearing in mind that the reason we we are saying this is happening is because of sanctions being imposed. I can't see any insurer, reinsurer in uh, certainly regulated within the EU, UK or, or the US uh, being able to do this, even if they wanted to. In the past, in, in similar situations, um, some uh, facilities have, have uh, come up in different parts of the world, um, but it's one thing to put some capital together to be able to provide cover and another to actually deliver in the case of uh, a casualty or a claim or you know you imagine a tanker let's say um, a facility set up in china which is not uh, aware there are no sanctions against the trade um, and, and and there's a big pollution claim you know how how does one go about addressing that claim it's not just about having the capital in place so i i guess uh, theoretically it's it's possible but I'd say it's it's very difficult under the current circumstances. It's uh, certainly possible. I don't see something imminently coming up uh, just yet. Okay, thanks, Sanjit. Uh, this is probably one for David. David, it, many Russian ports and terminals might be controlled by a, a, a Russian authority or a, a, a sanctioned company. Um, if there was an incident, let's say an FFO incident, where the port was damaged by the ship, for instance, how would that impact on P&I cover? That, that would give rise to the sort of practical issues that, that I mentioned before. Uh, it, I said uh, earlier that one of the areas where we might find it difficult to provide the normal level of cover would be, for example, providing security. Um, if, if, if the people you're looking to provide security to as a club are, are uh, potentially subject to sanctions um, and just other ways of pointing surveyors, um, trying to handle the claims, pay the claims, all of that is going to be made much more difficult if uh, you are dealing with Russian authorities or, or someone that is uh, subject to sanctions. So you know, what, what, whilst, whilst we can give some level of comfort about cover not being prejudiced as long as the trade is lawful and prudent um, there are still going to be unavoidable practical issues trying to provide the normal level of service that we do uh, in, in as a result of a maritime incident thanks david uh, next question if, if a vessel delivers a cargo Russian origin cargo within EU via STS is the member obliged to check or know the end destination of the cargo it's probably a sanctions thing mark yeah I mean I suppose the um there, there must come a point where actually the um, the responsibility that if the cargo is getting unsold and unsold and unsold, there must be uh, there must come a point where actually it becomes too it becomes too remote. However, you know if you're doing something via STS, all the uh, the consistent guidance from the US and from the and from the EU, not just in relation to Russia, but going back in relation to Iran and Syria, is that STS operations are one of the primary tools for the circumvention of sanctions. 
so I don't think it's right to just close your eyes to where that cargo is 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 going. If you are uh, discharging into SGS, then I would certainly be I'd certainly be wanting some uh, confirmation as to where that cargo is likely to or where that cargo is definitely going to uh, going to end up. I think the, the the simple point is just be often on the on, on on STS just take a step back and think well why are we why why are we asked why are we being asked to do this via STS and 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 why is it not just a um, being discharged at a specific port now obviously there may be very good commercial reasons as to why it makes sense to do an STS but um it may be that actually what's going on is a circumvention of sanctions because you somebody is trying to hide the origin of the of of the cargo and that's something just to be something just to be alive to Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, the next question is around. Uh, it's a quite interesting question, actually. It's around self-sanctioning, uh, and we're, we're seeing, you know, um, banks, uh, people, people like that, actually going a bit further than the actual sanctions and might legally require them to, because they are very concerned about what uh, what their exposure might be if sanctions come in. Uh, and and the, the question basically says. Do, do, do we at North or, or anybody in wider IG, I don't know if you even comment on that, would we consider self-imposing wider measures on, on members who've traded to Russia after the invasion took place with that, you know, with that trading obviously still being legal? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the core, our core purpose is to try and help our members trade. I mean, we're, you know, we're not trying, we're, we're trying to be there, we're trying to assist. We're trying to ensure they can trade with trade with confidence. So it's I don't think it's really our job as a as a PNI club uh, to be doing much more than the than is we have to comp we have to uh, we have to comply with our legal obligations. We have to be aware of the legal and commercial um, legal and commercial situation that we find ourselves in. But I'm not sure that it's our it's our job to be sanctioning our members or sanctioning um, ship owners or, 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 or charterers. We're there to try and help our um, help our members within the legal framework that we that we find ourselves in. I mean, it is quite it is quite interesting. I think one of the things we saw with Venezuela, for example, was clauses being slipped into charter parties saying uh, if the vessel is called Venezuela in the previous 12 months, then that wouldn't be acceptable for for for, for fixing uh, because of the wider commercial consequences of a, of a vessel having been to Venezuela, that being flagged up on on software which uh, screens where vessels have have been. And then that ask, people asking more questions. OK, well, we can see your vessel has been to Venezuela six months ago. Um, tell us what she was doing then. And as I say, often having clauses in charter parties, which made it clear that the vessel, there was a warranty that the vessel hadn't been to Venezuela in the previous 12 months. The danger, I guess, of doing a Russian voyage now is that when somebody comes to screen your vessel in six months time, it will show that the vessel is called Russia. And because of the sanctions framework that we now that we now have to all comply with, that may trigger further questions. So even if you're doing something which is lawful now, six months down the line, when you're trying to charter your ship out, your potential charterer may start asking questions and say, OK, well, I can see that your vessel went to Russia. Tell me about what was what was happening. It may be that the bank at that stage six months down the line would also be saying, oh, well, we can see your ship went to Russia. Tell us about what was what was happening. So I think there is a there is a really good general point here to be made, which is just because something is lawful today doesn't mean that you might not have to explain the analysis that you went through to ensure that it was lawful and to ensure that what you was doing was OK. You may have to explain that at a later stage, whether it's to a regulator, whether it's to a, a, a commercial partner. Great, thanks, Mark. Uh, another one for you, thanks, it's very important. Uh, it, it's around the, the definition of execution in the uh, paragraph two of Article 5 AA of the EU legislation. It says a contract needs to be executed uh, by the 15th of May. Does that mean that the whole transaction has to be concluded by that date? Or the example given, execution in a charter party means signing the scene or the discharge of the cargo. What, what, what's the what's the view on that? 
Yeah, I'm hoping this is one that we can give a bit of a clear answer on. Uh, I think in my view, the, the answer is you have to do everything by the 15th of May. You know, the prohibition says that it, the prohibition shall not apply to the execution until 15th of May of contracts concluded before 16th of March. So the, the contract has to be signed before the 16th of March. And then in my mind, at least the execution of that of that contract means the performance of it. And so the performance of it would be the carriage of the, the cargo, and that has to be completed by the 15th of May. Um, I guess the only the only caveat to that, I would say, is that the, as I mentioned earlier, the enforcement of the EU regulations is down to individual member member states. And in the first instance, at least, it's for individual member states to interpret the wording of the EU regulation. So if you were a Greek ship owner, for example, it would be for the Greek authorities to determine exactly what that paragraph uh, paragraph means. OK, thanks, Mark. That's clear. Uh, OK, let's see if we can get a, somebody under the mark for, for, for a couple of minutes. Uh, David, a question on PI security. Uh, people asking, are we still able to put up security in a Russian port when they, obviously when there's no sanctions implications? And if there are any alternatives to to providing security if we were to have problems? I think um, on the assumption that that there were no sanctions issues, it should be possible in the normal way to put up uh, security. The, the, the problem really arises is, is, is where you're, you're examining whether you can put up security and there's a clear sanctions risk uh, from the outset and then a decision has to be made as to whether it can be done or not. Uh, and the normal alternatives to club security like bank guarantees would have the same issues uh, as would say a payment into court. Um, so all, all the alternatives are affected by the same problems. But if, if, if there are no uh, sanctions issues uh, and there are there are no practical problems, that, that, then it should be possible um, to put up security in the, in, in the normal way. Uh, it would depend on, on exactly what you're dealing with. But the, whenever you're dealing with a Russian port, an incident at a Russian port, that there is going to have to be a close examination. Sorry, right, Colin, can I just, just expand on the practical issues there? Because it's, you know, yes. David, David's absolutely right. But the, you know, the, the point is this, that, that very few, there's, there's very little financial engagement with Russia now. Uh, the provision of security is discretionary. Clubs would be very reluctant to provide security where they know they cannot honour the terms of that security. So uh, you, yeah, I think if you're engaged in Russian trade um, and you have a routine uh, P&I claim, um, the the expectation is that it's not going to be possible for the club to provide security. And as David absolutely said, if the club can't provide it, it's highly unlikely that you're going to be able to get security from a from a bank. So as we've seen in Iran, with lawful trade into Iran, the ship will sit there for quite a long period of time, possibly possibly get lost. And that's a risk that ship owners really need to factor into any any Russian trade. Now. Yeah, it, it, it's a very important point that, Mike, because, you know, what we might want to do and can do legally is it, stymied sometimes by the banking system. So it, it's it's very important for, for, for owners to think about that wider picture. Yeah. Uh, okay, let me see what will happen now. That's about security, another question about security. Uh, Here's, here's a probably a, a, a forward looking question. Might might we get to a point where we think that a vessel, vessel has called it a Russian port with a legal trade might start to be treated the same as, you know, the same sort of scrutiny that vessels call in North Korea or Iran? I think Mark touched on that earlier. Uh, you know, you, you might be asked what you were doing there. So I think you know that is something that's going to develop that picture will develop in the future uh, as what your different counterparties and some authorities will will ask for if they see your vessel has has called it russia uh, another question about bank guarantees uh, to some of the pre the, the pre-submitted questions uh there's a couple of questions around um if if sanctions do come in for oil and gas, 
uh, will cover still be available in northern way for, for other commodities. So dry bulk, uh, presumably, you know, anything that's not sanctioned. Uh, probably, David, not, not for you. Um, I, I think it will be the same situation as we're currently facing. If, if the ban is specific on a certain trade, uh, then um, you know that, that wouldn't necessarily affect others as long as it was lawful to provide uh, insurance and the trade is, is prudent. And I certainly know from speaking to our members that that they they want to continue to deliver essential goods into Russia in particular medicines and food you don't want to exacerbate the crisis by um but by, by uh, overreacting and and, and um and stopping all flow of goods into that country okay um, probably another question for you david um it, it's around the carry of right to end transportation near russia near russia nearby russia under a multi-modal or through bill Yes, right. yes. I mean, it, it's a very good question, and and um, certainly one that that uh, liner operators are, are asking quite a lot. Uh, I, I think generally it, it really depends where you are taking this cargo. If if you are taking it to an area which is directly affected by the conflict, there is a a physical risk. Then you know you need to take legal advice, but um, it's more likely that the sort of standard liberty clauses one sees in in, in multimodal bills uh and in and in ordinary seaway uh bills that, that they they might protect you and allow you to um to, to to stop short of destination and to discharge the cargo at an alternative place but normally then it becomes a practical problem you still need to speak to the shippers or or uh, your other counterparts and work out what you're going to do with this cargo because if it's not going to go to destination where is it going to go? Um, for those Russian ports outside of the Black Sea, um, for, 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 for lawful cargo, d different companies seem to have different um, ideas about this. Some think that they can just not deliver it to say St. Petersburg and deviate to another port. Now that is going to be much more difficult to justify um, where that, that there's no prohibition legally on delivering it to that port, uh, but there are other factors weighing on the carrier's mind as to why they might not want to do it. And as I say, d d different carriers are taking different approaches, but much more difficult if you're taking it, uh, if you don't want to take it to a port outside uh, of the Black Sea. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, thanks very much, everybody. I think. We've just about exhausted our questions, so um, we'll, we'll bring things to a close. If you haven't had your question answered directly, it's been answered, I think, in uh, in, in some part of the webinar. Uh, and we, I, we hope that you find the webinar helpful. Uh, you know, we are aware the Ukraine situation is extremely taxing for for some of our members when it comes to trade. So we shall uh, we shall keep up our advices. Uh, and just keep uh, liaising with the club if you have a, a specific question that you you need answered. Uh, so I think we'll bring things to a close there. Uh, thank you very much indeed for your time and attending this morning, and we, we hope you've, you've found it helpful. Thank you.